Moving on, we come to the capital account transactions now. Revising the definition for the meaning of capital account transaction, section 2E. Capital account transaction means a transaction which alters, modifies, increases or decreases the assets and liabilities, including contingent liabilities, outside India of a person resident in India or those in India of a person resident outside India and includes transactions covered in section 16. So when a person resident in India acquires, disposes of, transfers, reduces, increases his assets or liabilities abroad, it is a capital account transaction. Similarly, where a foreigner acquires, transfers, incurs, reduces assets or liabilities in India, that will become a capital account transaction. Can we freely permit that? Should we prohibit that? Should we restrict that? Is the subject matter for discussion under section 3, section 6. So this is the definition. Now, if you break it up for an easy understanding or imagination, it would look like this. The ingredients of the definition, a change in the value of assets and liabilities is the first component. Outside India of a person resident in India and a third in India of a person resident outside India. So these are the three limbs of the definition, components of the definition. There is a change in the value of assets and liabilities. Either it is acquired or added or decreased. Outside India by a person resident in India. In India by a person resident outside India. So now this outside India, in India, person resident in India, person resident outside India. Let's analyze them and make it a little graphical to understand it. So further going on with the classification, any transaction which alters assets and liabilities of a person resident in India, of a person resident outside India. Now if you have a permutation combination there, in India, outside India, in India, outside India. So assets and liabilities of a person resident in India, in India, why do I bother? Assets and liabilities of a person resident outside India, outside India, again why do I bother? So I exclude those two. So our matter of focus here is assets and liabilities of a person resident in India, outside India. When there is a transaction that alters that. Assets and liabilities of a person resident outside India, in India, when a transaction alters that. This is why we have defined, it is not just movement of assets and liabilities. It is movement in assets and liabilities of a person resident in India outside India or of a person resident outside India in India. The other two are excluded. We need not bother about them. Why? In the first case, it does not involve foreign exchange. In the second case, it involves foreign exchange, rupee being connected to it in no way. Because you are talking of assets and liabilities of a person resident outside India and located outside India. We are concerned with where the cross connection arises, rupees for dollars, rupees for pound sterling or the other way around. Here one is completely in Indian rupees with no foreign exchange involved. The other is completely in foreign exchange with no rupees involved. That is why the definition streams to only these two. Assets and liabilities of a person resident in India, outside India. Assets and liabilities of a person resident outside India, in India, not outside India. So although we say assets and liabilities, we are focusing a little harder on immovable property, land, buildings or land and buildings. Immovable properties basically is a subject matter for discussion. Although we use the word assets and liabilities is a very large term. I don't have to explain that to a chartered accountant. So here when you say assets and liabilities, it is loans, it is deposits, it is immovable property comprising of land or buildings or both. 
plantation activities, transferable development rights, nidhi activities. So these are certain things which are focused on, although we say generally, assets and liabilities. So any transaction that alters assets and liabilities of a person resident in India, in India, outside India, any transaction that alters assets and liabilities of a person resident outside India, in India, outside India, I don't have to worry about the extremes because that is not the subject matter under the FEMA. So our focus streamlines to assets and liabilities of a person resident in India, outside India, and assets and liabilities of a person resident outside India, in India. That is our matter of focus. So this will give you an imaginary picture of what we are going to deal with here. Now coming to the RBI powers with respect to capital account transactions. Such transactions are generally permitted. The RBI may however, in consultation with the central government, restrict any transactions other than. Now here it only talks about may restrict. Such transactions are generally permitted. The RBI may, but still, in consultation with the central government, restrict any such transactions other than payments due on amortization of loans or for depreciation of direct investments in the ordinary course of business. Again, both of them are very, very specific. There is no room for generality. Such transactions are generally permitted, however, the RBI may, however, in consultation with the central government, restrict any such transactions in any manner. Uh, this power has already been used and there are restrictions which we are coming to. So there are two transactions on which restrictions cannot be imposed. The RBI and the central government have sat together and decided that we will not impose restrictions on two payments. Payments due on amortization of loans and for depreciation of investments, direct investments in the ordinary course of business, which means it is repayment of loans and providing for replacement of direct investments, which are in the ordinary course of business, trading investments. So capital account transactions, looking at it from the RBI's point of view, these transactions are generally permitted but may be restricted by the RBI in consultation with the central government. They can impose any restrictions, any volumes, any limits, any kind of transactions, but there are two which will remain unaffected. They cannot be restricted. So they are freely permitted. Two transactions freely permitted. Pay payments due on amortization of loans. Amortization of a loan is a repayment of a loan or for depreciation of direct investments in the ordinary course of business. That is providing for a replacement of direct investments or trade investments, investments which are in the ordinary course of business. First of all, are they capital account transactions? Yes. One is a liability, the other is an asset. So these two capital account transactions are untouchable and they are untouched by the RBI. So we are dealing with the RBI's power here. What next? RBI vis-a-vis -vis capital account transactions. RBI versus capital account transactions. Where does the RBI stand with respect to capital account transactions? Now, even before I start, I am coming to a list. The RBI may, by regulations, prohibit or restrict the following. Putting it a little differently, putting it back in our Indian legal perspective, the RBI may by regulations prohibit or restrict only the following. Two of them that we have seen that the RBI cannot restrict. Now we are coming to those which the RBI may restrict, regulate, prohibit. Now we are coming to a list which is general. General in the sense these can be curbed or prohibited or restricted by the RBI. How it is actually done is coming up for discussion later. 
So the RBI positions itself with respect to capital account transactions, taking the power under the FEMA to regulate, prohibit or restrict any of the following capital account transactions. Transfer or issue of any foreign security by a person resident in India. A person resident in India has acquired foreign security, security, shares, debentures, deposit receipts, etc. The RBI may by regulations prohibit or restrict this. How is it actually prohibited, restricted, regulated? We are coming to. Transfer or issue of any foreign security by a person resident in India. Transfer or issue of any security by a person resident outside India or its office, agency or branch. So both of them are securities. One is transfer or issue of any foreign security by a person resident in India. You will need foreign exchange for this. And it's a capital account transaction. It's an investment. Investment is an asset. Asset is a capital account transaction. Anything that moves an asset upward, downward is a capital account transaction. So the RBI may, by regulations, RBI, regulations, central government, rules. We are familiar with this in our securities laws. So the RBI, RBI may, by imposing, by publishing regulations, prohibit or restrict transfer or issue of a foreign security by a person resident in India, transfer or issue of any security by a person resident outside India or its office or agency or branch, any borrowing or lending in Forex by whatever name called. So here we are only seeing that the RBI is taking the power to restrict them or prohibit them. How is it actually done? We are coming to. Any borrowing or lending in Forex by whatever name called. Any borrowing or lending in INR, in Indian rupees, between a person resident in India and a person resident outside India. Person resident in India giving a loan to a person resident outside India or the other way around. That may be restricted. Deposits between a person resident in India and a person resident outside India. Cross-border deposits, cross-border borrowings, cross-border securities may be restricted. Deposits made by a person resident in India with a person resident outside India. Export or import or holding of currency or currency notes. Holding of currency or currency notes, I can understand. Export or import of currency, this is why I said, deal with foreign currency, treat foreign currency as goods to understand it better. Whether it is financial management or the FEMA 99. Exporting currency, importing currency. I don't think any person other than the RBI can do this. So the RBI will restrict. Indians cannot just print the currency and send it out like goods, Indian rupees. Or they cannot place an order for 2,50,000 USD. That cannot be done. It has to be earned. The first has to be printed and printed by the RBI. You remember the definition of the word currency. Export of currency, import of currency, holding of currency or currency notes. Currency is a subject matter. So naturally that has to be restricted. Next, transfer of immovable property outside India other than as a lease, not exceeding 5 years by a person resident in India can be regulated. So we are dealing with a set of transactions which can be regulated, monitored, restricted by the RBI. Acquisition or transfer of immovable property in India other than as a lease not exceeding 5 years by a person resident outside India because that is allowed. We will be seeing that a little later. Why a little later? We have seen this under section 4. Transfer of immobile property outside India by a person resident in India. However, if that transfer is as a lease, not more than 5 years, that is permitted. We have seen that in section 4. Similarly, it is contrary. Acquisition or transfer of immobile property in India by a person resident outside India other than as a lease, not exceeding 5 years, mirror images of each other. Guarantee or surety in respect of a debt, obligation or other liability 
of a person resident outside India owed to a person resident in India or a person resident outside India. It is similar to taking a loan. This I think even the provisions of the Companies Act deals with them on par. A loan guarantee and indemnity. What, what, what is the terminology used there? Section 185, 186. Any loan security or guarantee given? Yes. Now I recollect. Loan given, guarantee given, surety or security given are treated on par. The same thing here. Any guarantee or surety in respect of a debt obligation or other liability of a person resident outside India owed to a person resident in India or outside India by a person resident in India can be restricted. So coming back to them one by one, let me revise. What are the transactions on which? What are the capital account transactions on which? The RBI can impose restrictions or impose prohibitions through regulations. Transfer or issue of a foreign security by a person resident in India. Transfer or issue of any security by a person resident outside India or its office or agency or branch. Any borrowing or lending in Forex by whatever name called. Any borrowing or lending in INR between a person resident in India and person resident outside India. Deposits between persons resident in India and persons resident outside India. Export or import or holding of currency or currency notes by persons resident in India or a person resident outside India. Transfer of immobile property outside India other than as a lease not exceeding 5 years by a person resident in India. Acquisition or transfer of immobile property in India other than as a lease not exceeding 5 years by a person resident outside India. Guarantee or surety in respect of a debt or obligation or other liability of a person resident outside India owed to a person resident in India or outside India, the guarantee being given by a person resident in India. Now let's compare the person resident in India versus the person resident outside India when it comes to a cross holding. Cross holding is our matter of concern. Property, assets, liabilities acquired, disposed of, otherwise dealt with of property outside India by a person resident in India or property in India by a person resident outside India. Any person resident in India may hold, own, transfer or invest in foreign currency, securities or immobile property outside India. Connect this to section 4. If it was acquired at a time when he was a resident outside India, or inherited from a person who was resident outside India. Person resident in India, holding, owning, transferring, etc., foreign currency, securities, or removable property outside India, it was acquired at a time when this person resident in India was a resident of that country. You can hold on to the property. Or it is inherited, the property outside India of a person resident in India has been inherited from a person who is a relative of this person resident in India, the relative being person resident outside India. So it is either acquired when you were a resident of that country or you have inherited it under a will or a gift or an inheritance or a succession from a person who is resident outside India. The same parallel provision of the ABBA applies in relation to a person resident outside India. Now, it would be an interesting exercise to word this. How will you word it? The same parallel provision. Let us try to word it. Any person resident outside India may hold, own, transfer or invest in Indian currency, securities or immobile property in India. If it was acquired at a time when he was a resident in India, or it has been inherited from a person who was resident in India. And that is why I call it cross-holding. 
person resident in India, which means that otherwise it is not allowed. This you can. So any person resident in India may hold own transfer invest in foreign currency, foreign securities or foreign immovable property that is outside India if it was acquired at a time when he was a resident outside India or inherited from a person who was resident outside India. The same parallel provision applies in relation to a person resident outside India also. Classification of the transactions. How do we classify them now? The classification of transactions, I mean classification of capital account transactions, those which are permissible for a person resident in India is given by Schedule 1. So, Schedule 1 is a list of capital account transactions permissible for a person resident in India. Permissible person resident in India. Schedule 2, those which are permissible for a person resident outside India and how I propose to do this is to compare them in a table. The same parallel transactions taken in two columns of a table. How does it look? I am going to make a comparative study like this. So those permissible for a person resident outside India, those which are completely prohibited and those on which a restriction cannot be imposed. What have we seen on this before? Amortization of loans or the replacement of depreciation on direct investments. So as far as the capital account transactions are concerned, if I make a classification of them, after going through the RBI's power, I have a classification very similar to the classification that we made for current account transactions. So capital account transactions are foreign type, those which are permissible for a person resident in India, those which are permissible for a person resident outside India, Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 respectively, those which are completely prohibited. Completely prohibited for persons resident in India and persons resident outside India. For example, a person resident outside India cannot participate in Nidhi activities, plantation activities, farmhouse activities, transferable development rights. We are coming to all of them. So all these four classifications that you see, those four classifications will be taken that up in detail. So those that are completely prohibited and those on which a prohibition or a restriction cannot be imposed, which actually refers to the loans and investments. So this is the classification here. Just like in current account transactions, what was the classification we made there? Those which are completely prohibited, those which are permitted with approval of the central government, those which are permitted with approval of the RBI. Here this is the classification. Permissible for PRII, Schedule 1. Permissible for PROI, Schedule 2. Completely prohibited and unprohibitable, not an English word. Those on which a restriction or a prohibition cannot be imposed, the fourth category. So we will take it in this clockwise order. What are these transactions? Restriction cannot be imposed on payments due on amortization of loans that we have seen and restriction cannot be imposed on for depreciation of direct investments in the ordinary course of business. Transactions which are completely prohibited. So I am dealing with those two now. The bottom two going back to our previous note. Those permissible for a person resident in India, Schedule 1. Those permissible for a person resident outside India, Schedule 2. Those which are completely prohibited and those on which a prohibition or restriction cannot be imposed. I am taking up the latter two first so that we can concentrate on the first two. So restrictions cannot be imposed on 
by the RBI in consultation with the central government, payments due on amortization of loans or on or for depreciation of direct investments in the ordinary course of business, they cannot be restricted. We have seen this before. Transactions which are completely prohibited, like I was referring to in a context before, while explaining explain the previous picture. What are the transactions which are completely prohibited? Chit funds. People from South India, people from God's own country, Kerala will understand this better. Chit funds are very popular there. A very nice mechanism for housewives to make small contributions in installments every month and get a lump sum, either after paying the entire installments or even before that, either time-based or auction-based. Mm. Chit fund is a method whereby different members, different parties contribute a certain sum of money every month towards a fund and every month one of them depending on need or depending on auction of the tickets, the amount is paid. So that's how a chit fund works. So in a chit fund like that in India, a, a person resident outside India cannot contribute or a person resident in India cannot contribute in a chit fund being operated or run outside India. Nidhi, you have a separate chapter itself from this in the Companies Act. The Nidhi companies, mutual benefit companies. I will not allow a person resident outside India to participate because these are completely prohibited transactions to participate in the capital of, in the contribution of, in the activities of a Nidhi company in India. Nidhi basically is a glorified, it's a corporate cooperative principled kind of an organization. Agricultural activities, agricultural and plantation activities. We don't want foreign direct investment in agriculture in India. We will not allow Indian persons who are residents to contribute to agricultural activities outside India. Agriculture is our problem. Agriculture is our backbone. I have been hearing this right from my college days. Agriculture is India's backbone and it continues to be the backbone. And on the other hand, Moksha Gundam Vishweshwaraya has said that industrialize or perish. So we have identified a via media now, industrial agriculture, commercial agriculture, where agri agriculture blends with technology. Your Prime Minister is even planning to fix up UPS, power systems or units, by the side of an agricultural field. So that agriculture can be completely technologized. Agriculture is our backbone. Even today, right from 1947, why 1947? Give the three years to enjoy freedom. 1950. Since then, even today, 65 to 70 percent of the population of India, directly or indirectly engaged in agriculture. Agriculture in India is completely dependent on the monsoons. If a monsoon comes or if and when a monsoon comes and in the right quantity, at the right time, only then agriculture survives in India. We are a lot dependent on nature with respect to the Indian economy. So we are conveying the message that agriculture is our problem. We will take care of it. You don't interfere. But at the same time, I don't want persons resident in India to contribute to agricultural activities outside India. If you can contribute at all, do it within India. Similarly, real estate, construction, purchase, development of property. Real estate is a booming sector and real estate will continue to boom until the entire land on earth is occupied by buildings. A building is raised on a particular piece of land. Now the building is quite new. You can't demolish it. So you keep constructing on that. 
buildings with 20 floors, 25 floors, 30 floors, common site, the real estate, that's a real estate sector. And on the other hand, old buildings, dilapidated buildings, which are multi-storied, collapsing also. Good that they are collapsing, of course, my due respect to those who die in the accident. But then for real estate to boom, existing bad real estate must be destroyed. If, the ma if man doesn't do it, nature will do it. So no contribution from persons resident outside India into real estate in India or the vice versa. A person resident in India shall not invest in real estate outside India. The next is transferable development rights, a new concept which has come in where the owner of a building transfers the building to a builder or a developer to convert this into multiple residential plots. You have provisions for this in the Income Tax Act also. It is converted into multiple buildings or apartments and as a consideration, the developer allots a residential unit to the owner. So I have a house which is about 25-30 years old. I would like to transfer this to a developer, a prestige meridian or some developer of real estate, some construction company. That construction company will demolish this property and develop a complex or an apartment there or a set of flats and one flat or apartment is allotted to me as a consideration for selling the piece of land on which today this apartment stands. A very new concept at least in the major cities of India, the, the B class, the B category, the, the, what do I say, cities in India, not the metros, metros and cosmos, the entire two cities. This is a very common site, these transferable development rights. Development of property, because land is a limited resource we can understand. So buildings which are already existing on land, we revise them. If they have to be developed or improved, I give a transferable development right. So the development right is given by the owner to a developer. Now that right in itself can be transferred and if it is done, that will become a capital account transaction. So what are the classification of transactions at the lower end? Keeping the other two for serious study a little later. These two are simple. Restrictions cannot be imposed on payments due on amortization of loans or restriction cannot be imposed on depreciation, provision for depreciation of direct investments in the ordinary course of business. Transactions which are completely prohibited and I have not used etc there, which means that if the following transactions are completely prohibited, only these are prohibited. Others may be restricted or may be freely allowed. What are the transactions completely prohibited cross-border basis? Chit funds, nidhi, agricultural activities, real estate and transferable development rights. So what are we now left with? We are left with Transactions or capital account transactions which are permitted for a person resident in India given by Schedule 1. Capital account transactions permitted for a person resident outside India given by Schedule 2. Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 to what? To the foreign exchange management permitted capital accounts regulations. So this is the basic idea of the capital account transactions that we have seen. In our next session, we will take up the next two types of capital account transactions. So we continue with this discussion in the next session. Thank you.